meters of fencing. So, for example, you could you could make a fan, uh, tennis court that was here's your house. You could make these um, what a hundred. Well, and this a hundred, right? You could make a tennis court like that, right? You could also make one that was, you have 300 meters of fencing, <coughs> so you could make 10, 10, and 280. That would be another size. Well, your job is to figure out, what, how am I gonna cut this fence up, arrange this fence, so I get the biggest area that I can. So what are your thoughts on that? How do you think we might go about solving that problem without doing trial and error forever? Well, something has to be X. Would you agree with that? So I'll just make these X. I can make anything I want X. I'll make that X. They match. It's a rectangle. Now, what would this be then? Patty? Well, I really want, I'm, I've already got, I'm, I'm going to calculate my area. So I've already got a variable here and a variable here. I really don't want to put in a third one, Patty. Can you think of another strategy? Peyton? I have a question. I don't understand how it could be bigger than 300. Because if you only have... How what could be bigger than 300? Because you only have 300 meters of space. Exactly. So what do you say? Nobody said it's going to be bigger than 300. Are you uh, telling me what the domain is? Is that right? <laughs> well, I mean, we, nobody, I'm not sure why you're saying what you're saying. Nobody said it's bigger than 300. Oh, okay. These, these are, we don't know what these so are. Don't we know that the bigger area is 300? No, 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 no. The, the, this, this is 300. Oh, okay. The, the amount of fencing is 300, but not the area. See, there's a difference. Okay. The amount of fencing is like perimeter, right? Okay, but you're right. All these added up have to be 300. And that's the key to figuring out how long this is. Sarah? So that's why I do 300 minus 2x. That's exactly what it is. 300 minus 2x. Now, why is it 300 minus 2x? Well, all together, like Peyton said, we have 300 meters of fencing. If you put x of it here and x of it here, what's left? 300 minus the 2x. Now, what is the area of this rectangle? How will I express the area of the tennis court? X times 300 minus 2X. So I have an equation that looks like this. If I put in Y for my area, I have 300X minus 2X squared. What kind of an equation is that? I know it's backwards, but what kind of an equation is that? That's quadratic. And see that negative two right there on the x squared? What does that tell me about that quadratic function? It's going down. So wait a minute. This equation, if I graphed it on my calculator, would look like that, right? What do I need in this problem? What's my goal? What am I looking for? Maximum. Wait a minute, I have a parabola opening down, and I want the maximum. I don't need my calculator to do that. If I want the maximum, what do I really just want? The vertex. The vertex. So here we go. Um, I'm not going to complete the square. I think I'll do x equals negative b. Watch it now. The equation is backwards. So negative b over 2a gives me 75. which means this dimension is, now this one won't be 75. What's 300 minus 2 times 75? 150. 150. 
So the dimensions of my tennis court are 75 by 150. Was that the question or what was the exact question? What is the area? What is the area? Okay, so what am I going to do to get the area? 75 times 150. Oh, which I probably should be able to do in my head, but I'm not going to. 11,250. And we'll guess. And there we go. There's the answer to the question. Now, yesterday, think back to yesterday, we did a rectangle problem. It was a picture being framed. Did we do that one? Okay. And when we framed that picture, we didn't find the maximum because that question didn't say find the maximum something. It said find the dimensions of the picture. So they're both rectangle problems, but the, we handled them a little bit differently because the, the question is different. All right, turn the page. Go to the back side of that paper. And look at number six. This is what I'm talking about. Number six says we have a picture and we know that its area is 66. And your job is to find the dimensions of the picture. Now, it doesn't say anything about maximum or minimum, so I'm not going to be doing the vertex. I'm going to set up an equation and solve it. That's all I'm going to do. So what's that equation going to look like in this problem? The length is five more than the width. X and X plus five. The area is 66. Sam, I will confiscate it. Do you know how badly that hurts my feelings? Sam. Area is length times width. So my formula will be x times x plus 5 equals 66. Length times width is the area, which they told me is 66. So x squared plus 5x minus 66 equals 0. I'm thinking ahead. This is a quadratic equation. I like to have them equal to 0. And then I can solve it how? Factor. Well, this one does factor. Some of you don't like to factor, and that's perfectly OK. Sometimes they don't factor. In which case you would use what? Quadratic. The quadratic formula probably. So this one is what, 11 and 6? So we get x equals negative 11, which is extraneous, and x equals 6, which is the answer. <coughs> so one dimension is 6 and the other dimension is 11. And that's the answer to the question. The two problems we've done this morning both involve finding area of rectangles, but they're different, right? They're different in how we approach them. Maximum or minimum means find the vertex. Otherwise, you're just solving it like always. All right, let's look at number five. These are the ones we were doing when the bell rang yesterday or when the period ended yesterday. Number five. All right, so read the problem and see if you can remember anything from yesterday. Any kind of strategies we had yesterday. Okay, we're looking at number five. <coughs> Right now, what
what is Dan's revenue right now? Dan's revenue is what, or his income? Income or revenue, whatever you want to call it. What is it right now? <coughs> right now, he's selling them for $2 each, and he's selling 100 of them, right? <coughs> but he's done some market research and determined that what's going to happen? If he raises the price, this is the price. This is the number he sells. If he raises the price one dollar, he will lose two customers. So in other words, every change that he makes, the price is going up in dollar increments and the sales are going down in increments of two. Mallory? I have a question. Uh, we're assuming this problem is assuming that each customer buys one tennis yes. ball. Okay. Plus that it'll complicate it. <laughs> yes. All right. So what's that setup going to look like? We need to express his income or his revenue that shows the price going up in $1 increments and the sales going down by twos. What's that going to look like? 2 plus 1x, then of course you wouldn't have to put the 1 there, but I'm putting it there because it makes sense to me. 2 plus 1x times 100 minus, 2. 100 minus 2x. Price going up in increments of 1, sales going down in increments of 2. So we can FOIL. These are a little nice on our person yesterday. And I've got my equation, right? Now, what am I trying to do here? I'm trying to find a maximum. Do I have a parabola opening down? No. Yes. So finding the maximum is easy. It's just finding the vertex. So my vertex will be x equals, now the equation's all in the wrong order, so be careful, negative b over 2a, I think that's 24. Now, is that $24, 24 tennis balls, what is that 24? The number of increments, right? So the question says, um, what price should he charge? Well, he started out charging $2, right? And it's going up by ones 24 times. So how much are his tennis balls? Hey, wait, kids are making this way harder than it is. It's going up 24 times. Each time is a dollar. It started at two dollars, so the price will be twenty-six dollars. He's selling them for twenty-six dollars. Now that is an outrageous. I mean, obviously this problem is crazy. But did did you kind of have a feeling that was going to happen when you read it? Because notice the original price was only two dollars. But we're going up in dollar increments. That's a huge jump, right? But you're making this huge jump, but only losing two customers. So doesn't it make sense that you could have lots of increases before your customer base got too low? Mm -hmm. Just think about that for a minute. That isn't a very realistic problem at all, but that's the math anyway. Okay. All right. Now. There are some more problems in 2.1 that you need to be able to do, and I'm sure that you uh, will work on them. We're now going to move to 2.2, and there are just a couple of concepts in 2.2 that are important. The first part of 2.2 we're going to talk about are things called power functions. Now, power functions are simply any function where we have x raised to a power. So if you think about just your BFFs, 
you have this and this and this, but you also have this and this. These are all power functions. They are all x raised to a power. That's different than this one in which there's a power involved, but you see the difference? In a power function, x is to a power. In the exponential function, x is actually the exponent. So this is exponential, as you well know. It is not a power function. It will be handled in chapter three. It's a different situation. We're looking at power functions. Now you have absolutely no uh, problem seeing these as power functions, but what about these? Do you remember what power square rooting is? One half, that's x to the one half. What power is 1 over x? X to the negative, to the negative first. first. Very good. Those are power functions because they are x raised to a power. The takeaway from this little section of your book, and this, this we're not making a big deal out of this. It's a very general, general idea. But the takeaway is that power functions have very specific behaviors depending on what the power is. This guy is kind of different because he's a straight line. You know that, you know that's a straight line. So that power function looks like this, okay? Every other power function, and there are millions more I haven't listed, but every other power function is a curve going to be some kind of a curve. If you see a straight line, then you know it's x to the first. It has to be. Everything else is a curve. And you know that because you know what this looks like, and 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 they're all curves, right? Let's talk about the difference between those curves. If the power is bigger than 1, Power of one, we've already talked about, is the line. It is the only thing that's a line done. If the power is bigger than one, I want you to think about just the first quadrant. Think about just the first quadrant. What does that look like in the first <coughs> quadrant? Doesn't it look like this? What does this look like in just the first quadrant? Oh my gosh, isn't it kind of the same thing? Remember, your cubing function looks like this, right? So if you look at just the part in the first quadrant, doesn't it look like the quadratic? This is the behavior, this is the behavior of power functions when the power is bigger than one. It doesn't matter if it's x to the fifth, x to the twelfth. In quadrant one, you're gonna have that shape. Now, could it be steeper like this? Yes. Could it be flatter like this? Yes. But it's going to have that general shape. Okay? Now, what happens if you take one of these though and you put a negative, not there, you put a negative in front of it? How does that change it? Instead of going up in quadrant one, what's it gonna do? Go down in quadrant four. So would you agree that it might look like that if it had a negative coefficient? Open up your books page um, 197, 197, and look at problems 37 to 42. We're on page 197, and we're looking at 37 to 42. So far, the only powers we have talked
talked about are powers bigger than one. Any power bigger than one. And we have agreed that if it has a positive coefficient, it looks like that. And it has, it has a negative coefficient, it looks like that. So look at all the equations in number 37 to 42. Just 37 to 42. Do any of them match my blue curves that I have there on the board? Would 37 match that shape? Mm -hmm. Which one would 37 match? In your book, it would be G. Why does 37 match G? Because the power is bigger than one and the coefficient is negative. I, I can't tell if these people are paying attention or not. Are you following this conversation? Okay. All right. Are there any others there that have a power bigger than one? Oh, 40. Now I know the power is a fraction, but is, is five thirds bigger than one? So, and it has a negative coefficient, so it's another G. It would look like this right here if you graphed it. Ah, uh, that's all. Okay, so let's talk about the next kind of power. What if we have a positive power, but it's less than one? So we have a power that's less than one. Like this one, right? What does that look like? That looks like this, right? Now that's a different shape than this. This is what it looks like when you have a power less than one. If it has a negative coefficient, then it would look like this. Would you agree with that? So let's see if we can find any of those in these problems. Anything there have a power less than one? 39. 39? So which graph above there, which colored graph are you matching 39 to? D? D. Which is, you say there's another one? 42. Which colored graph are you matching 42 to? D has a positive coefficient and an exponent less than one. What if the power is negative? Well, if the power is negative, think about that's your BFF right here, right? If your power is negative, in quadrant one only, if we only look at quadrant one, that's what it looks like, right? That's what they look like when the exponent is negative. So, looking at the problems, what are you going to match number 38 to? It has a negative exponent. It's going to match with A. And what about 41? H. Because it has a negative coefficient and it flips over into the fourth quadrant. Okay, so basically power functions have three shapes, right? They have the shape like this, they have the shape like this, and they have the shape like this. And it totally depends on the size of the power. Got it? The the second thing, the only other thing that's in this section that's really worth talking about is um, the idea of variation. You've discussed this before. We have direct variation and we have inverse variation. Anybody remember anything about that? Direct and inverse variation. There's also something called joint variation, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. Okay, so you remember there are kind of general formulas for the variations. For direct variation, it's y equals kx, which 
doesn't take much to see that's really the same as y equals mx. The letter doesn't matter. So direct variation is a linear relationship. Does anybody know what it means to be to vary directly? I mean, that, that's the formula for it. We'll do a problem here in a minute. But does anybody know what that even means when we say things vary directly, Mallory? Um, just that the coefficient uh, directly like or like works together with the x, so it's like affecting x. So again, you're going like this because it's slope. I mean, yeah. it's slope. Think about this for a second. Christina and I go to the store together. Bananas cost 50 cents a pound. I buy two pounds, she buys three pounds. Who pays more? She does. Why does she pay more? Because she bought more. That's direct variation. If you buy more, you pay more. That's direct variation. When both variables go in the same direction, that's varying directly. So when Mallory was say, making hand motions like this, this X and Y are both going up. <coughs> Here, X and Y are both going down. If both factors, both variables in the problem are increasing, it's direct variation. Now, think about this. Patty and I live together. Not really, but let's just pretend for a moment we live together. We get in, get at the same time in the morning. We get in the car. He gets in his car. I get in my car. We drive to school. Drive exactly the same route. He goes 50 miles an hour. I go 30 miles an hour. What happens? Patty gets, there gets there first. So the faster his speed, the less time it took him to get there. That is not direct variation because speed is going up and time is going down. That's inverse variation. Think about chemistry class. What happens to the volume of a gas when you increase the pressure? When, you, when the pressure goes up, the volume goes down. That is inverse variation. Okay, one's going up, one's going down. The formula for inverse variation, you remember it? K over X, that's it exactly. Now, what do you have these formulas for? Well, they help you to set up problems once you know whether they vary directly or inversely. So on, on page 197, I'll just pick one. Oh, by the way, sometimes they will use the phrase is proportional to. That is direct variation. So if they say is proportional to, that, it, that is a signal it's direct variation. Okay, um, let's say, let's look at number 19. The current in an electrical circuit is inversely proportional, inversely proportional to the resistance R with a constant of variation V. When you wrote your formulas, you used K. You can use whatever letter you want. They're telling you to use V in problem number 19. So I is inversely proportional to R. I is inversely proportional to R. There's the setup for problem number 19. I is inversely proportional to R, and instead of using K, they told me to use V. That's all there is to it. If it would have been I is proportional to R, then it would have been I equals VR. If it would have been directly proportional or proportional. Okay? That's that. You should now be able to do two two homework pretty readily. All right, let's get your calculators out now. Now we're going to do some exploration on our calculator. I don't know how much of this you've already done in previous years, so I'm going to pretend you haven't done any of it. I'm going to start at the beginning. Because now we're getting into the heart of the chapter.
So here we go. Uh, let's set our window at just a standard size. Anybody remember what that is? Just a standard window? Negative 10 to 10, right. All right, and I'd like you to type in, we're just gonna graph, and we're not finding maximums and minimums all that, we're just kind of looking at it. So I'd like you to graph um, x minus one, x plus one, x minus two. So you don't boil it out, just type it in just like that. X minus one, X plus one, X minus two. Um, how many places does the curve cross the X axis? Any idea where those three might be? Those three points might be? Three at negative one. At negative one, one, and two. The factors of the problem give you the x-intercepts, give you the roots of the zeros. That's pretty easy, right? Now I want you to make a change, one change. I want you to take out that factor and actually, let's leave that one. Let's take out this one, leave that one, and square that one. So it's still a cubic polynomial. It's still a cubic polynomial, but now I have a repeated factor. What impact does that have on my graph? That's what you're checking. What impact does a repeated factor a, a squared factor happens twice. What impact did that have on your graph? Well, first of all, how many times do you cross the x-axis now? Three. You cross at negative one and at two. Now we say this one, however, has multiplicity two. And what that means is it occurs twice. What did that do graphically? What happened? What happened at two? What did the curve do at two? It, the, in the original picture, and I, I may have the spacing wrong, but this is what the original picture looked like. Now, it looks like this, right? So what happened when you had a squared factor? You have a tangent point, a bounce off point. Whenever you have a squared factor, the curve is gonna bounce at that point. It isn't gonna cross through. These were all pass-throughs. They passed right through the x-axis. As soon as you square a factor, then you don't have that anymore. You have a bounce off, a tangent zero. Well, what about if we just had the same factor three times? Now you can graph that on your calculator, but you don't need to. You already know what that one looks like. What's that one going to look like? Isn't it your cubing function? Mm -hmm. Scoot it over two, two, two places to the right. Now, <coughs> this one, we would say x equals two, that's the only zero, but we would say multiplicity three, because it happens three times. And how does the curve behave? It passes through, it doesn't bounce off, it passes through, but it passes through differently than it passed through here. Here it kind of just went straight through. What's it doing here? Squiggling through? So when you have a cubed factor, you're gonna go through, but you're gonna go through with a squiggle. Now, 
just saying, Mrs. Ford, this is great, but why do you make me do this? Because now we're going to put our calculators away, and we're going to graph a polynomial by hand. Oh. And it's going to be kind of an ugly polynomial. Wowzy. Now we're going to graph this without a calculator. We're going to graph it by hand. The first thing that I want you to do is to plot the x-intercepts. Plot the zeros. Now, that's easy. This problem is factored. Soon, I'm going to give them to you unfactored, and you're going to have to factor them. Because once you have the factors, you know exactly where we cross the x-axis. These are the points where we cross the x-axis. You okay with that? Now, there's one piece of information that I have not shared with you that I better before we jump in here. Because I'm not going to expect you to plot any more points. I'm going to give you, or I've already given you some information, I'm going to give you one more piece of information, and you're going to be able to sketch the curve without plotting a single point, except these. So here's that other piece of information. I want you to think about this cubic. These were all cubes. These were all the third power that we graphed. Did you notice that they all started down and ended up? Their degree is three. All of these are third degree polynomials and they start down and end up. If you graph the first degree polynomial, how would it behave? Starts down, ends up. Right? You haven't graphed any fifth degree polynomials, but if you did, it would start down and end up. Odd degree polynomials start down and end up. The only way you can change that is to put a negative in front of them. And if you put a negative in front of them, instead of starting down and ending up, they will start up and end down because a negative turns them upside down. But odd degree polynomials will always start and end differently. Even degree polynomials, on the other hand, think of x squared. How does x squared operate? Start up, end up, right? Every even degree polynomial is going to start and end in the same direction. Start up, end up unless you put a negative in front of it and then it will start down and down. So, with that in mind, Wyatt, the bell will ring when it rings. Do not watch it. With that in mind, what is the degree of this polynomial? It's a fourth degree polynomial. Does everybody see that? Four factors. Two of them happen to be the same. Even degree, <coughs> starts up, ends up, unless that's negative, which it isn't. So this curve is going to start up. It's going to come, start up here somewhere. It's going to come down and hit this point. Now, what does it do when it gets there? You have three choices. It goes right through it. It bounces off of it, or it squiggles through it. That dot came from this factor. Tell me what's going to happen. Go right through it. You're just going to zip right through it. And you're going to come down somewhere, but eventually you have to come up and hit that point, right? Because polynomials are connected. Everything's connected. So I don't care how far down you go. Doesn't matter. We're doing a quick sketch, getting a general shape. So it comes down, at some point it turns around and comes up to this point. Now what does it do when it gets to that point? That came from this factor, so it's going to bounce off. 
It's a tangent zero. Again, I don't care how far down it goes, it comes down, but it has to turn around at some point and come back up, right? Because it's got to pick up the three. And what does it do when it hits the three? Right through. And there we go. There is a quick sketch of that polynomial. You can sketch any polynomial. Let me give you one more. Do a quick sketch of this, no calculator necessary. So we always start by plotting our x-intercepts. They are the most important point. So here we go, I'll put them on there. Uh, I have one at negative one. I have one at three. And I have one at positive one. Everybody okay with that? Now, what's the degree of this polynomial? This is a fifth degree polynomial. That's odd. Odd polynomials start down and end up. Unless you put a negative coefficient on them, and then they start up and end down. So this guy starts up. Now, what does he do when he hits negative one, zero? Bounces off. And we know that because that came from this and that squared, right? So he goes up and comes down. Again, I don't worry about how high he goes. Calculus problem. I'm just sketching it in a quick sketch. Now he's coming down. What does he do when he hits that point? Straight through it. No squiggles, no bouncing, just straight through it. Turns around at some point and comes back up to this guy. At that point, he bounces off and heads down, which makes perfectly good sense because odd degree polynomials start and end in different directions. <coughs> Amazingly simple. So we're going to take it up a notch. Quick. <laughs> I thought that was How would you do that? That was not nice. Just whoa. Okay. So here is our third degree polynomial, and here are our directions. We are going to sketch, and uh, we're going to find the zeros. Now, obviously, I'm going to find the zeros before I sketch, because what, what's another name for zeros? What are the zeros? X-intercepts. So I'm going to do these in the opposite order that I wrote them. The zeros are going to come straight from the factors. So the first thing I need to do is factor this. Now you have factored things that look like this before. Actually, we have in this class factored things like this before. We did it factoring by grouping. Remember that? This is an issue, however, in this problem, because while I could group I could take the first two and take out an x squared, and I could take these and take out a negative two. What is wrong with that factoring by grouping? The parentheses don't match, and that's the key to grouping. If you're going to factor by grouping, the parentheses have to match. These do not match, so we won't be factoring by grouping. Do you have any idea what we will be doing? Well, you're going to love this. 
when we say find the zeros, what we really want to know is what x values are going to make this equation equal to zero, right? So we're going to guess. We're going to guess. <laughs> All right, we're gonna guess. So let's guess the number one. If I put one into this problem, I get one minus three minus six <laughs> doesn't it work? Yeah. I got lucky. I always try one first. One works a lot, especially in these book problems that are rigged. So one, the number one works. Now, what does that mean to me? That means that one of my factors must be X minus one? Yes. Remember, if you're a zero, if you're an X intercept, it means if you plug in the number, you get zero. So I picked, guessed the number one I plugged one in and it came out to equal zero. So one of my factors I now know. Now what could I do at this point? Guess again. I could guess again. I don't like this whole guessing thing. It makes me uncomfortable. I worry about running out of time. So is there any other strategy? Guessing again will work, although it doesn't work with repeated factors. So I don't like to do it. I don't like yeah. to guess again. Divide. Oh, I could divide it out. Yeah. And you're saying long division. I'd rather do synthetic division. That's what I was Yeah, about. yeah. So here's the idea. Those of you that are still saying, what the heck she's talking about? How, what do they know that I don't know? Think about it for a minute. If you have a big number, like 105, and I tell you to break it down into its factors, the first thing you should do is say, oh, Five goes into that. I know five is a factor of that. And then what do you do? You divide it out to find the other factors. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're going to do here. We know one of our factors is x minus one. So we're going to divide it out. We're going to do the division, the problem, divided by x minus one. But instead of doing long division, I'm going to do synthetic division. Remember that from last year? Uh, oh, it's easy. I'm Come on now. Yeah, it. we're not white. Long division is so much harder. This is easy. So out here in the box, or circle, or whatever you put out here, doesn't matter. Out here goes the number that you're dividing by. The factor was x minus 1, so I'm putting a 1 here. If the factor had been x plus 2, I would put a negative, negative 2 there. And then I'll write down all my coefficients in the problem, including their negatives. Now, you remember from last year that if you happen to have something missing here, now we don't. We have a cubed and a squared and a 1 and a constant. But if you had a power missing, do you remember you have to put in 0? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then this number, whatever it is, always comes straight down. Now, you remember the procedure? We're set up now. We take 1 times 1 and write it here. And then we add. Then we take 1 times negative 2 and write it here and add. And then we take 1 times negative 8 and write it here and add. Did I want that to happen? Yes. Yes, I did, because that spot right there is the remainder spot. That's the remainder. So I need, I need this part, which is what? What do those numbers represent, Maya? Exactly. You divided a cube by an x, so your answer was x squared, one less. Now, what do you notice about that little quadratic, Patty? It's a mean factor. How? Because, uh, when you 
chosen to guess numbers then the numbers you would that would have worked for you one worked for me I guessed one right off the bat what other numbers would have worked for you negative two, negative two and four I don't recommend repeated guessing I recommend doing the division and then Okay, so are we done with the zeros? Our zeros are one, negative two, and four. So now we can do our sketch. So remember, you plot your zeros. So you'll plot one at zero, or one, and negative two, now, what is the degree of this polynomial? Three. You know threes, odds, start down, end up, unless they're negative. This one's not. So it starts down. Is anything repeated? Did I have any squared or cubed factors there? No. So that tells me that as I draw my picture and connect my dots, I'm just going straight through everything, right? And there it is. That is a pretty amazing feat. The next time I see you, we are going to have stuff we did in the chapter. So we've piled on so much today. I want to make sure you haven't forgotten this. I did you guys. Okay. So let's go through this together and then I will hang out your megaphones and you'll be good to go. Everybody paying attention? Number one, what are you going to do? Pretend this is a quiz. You're on your own. How do we do this? Find the vertex and axis of symmetry. Now, on your quiz, I may do what they did in your homework and say, by completing the square. Those of you that have looked at the homework, there is a section that says, do it by completing the square. We do have another option. We practiced it a couple times earlier today. What's the other option to find the vertex? X equals negative B over 2A. Let's practice the completing the square on this one. So, what do I do to get ready to complete the square? I'm going to have to subtract 11 and divide by 2. The order you do that doesn't matter. you got to get both of them done. So I subtract the 11 and divide by 2. I will be left with that. Is that okay? Now we're actually ready to complete the square. So what will we do? Half of 4 is 2, and 2 squared is 4. So we're going to add 4 to both sides. I wish I had a penny for every time we forget to add it to both sides. Add it to both sides. This should be a square. What square is that? X minus 2. Perfect. 
this needs added together. So you have negative 11 halves and 8 halves. So 1 half y minus 3 halves. Does that look okay? I'm adding these together. Get a common denominator. Now what? Add three halves. And then times by two. And remember when you times by two, you multiply the parentheses by two, but nothing in it. So it becomes 2, x minus 2 squared, plus 3. And your job was to find the vertex and axis of symmetry, so you're ready to go. Where's your vertex? Positive 2, positive, two, positive 3. Connect this to what we just talked about in the previous chapter. This is your squaring function. Let a right two and up three. And what's my axis of symmetry? X equals two. Wait, so we would add the three minus the four and then put over four. Um, this, there's no four in the volcano. It's written as a square now. All right, number two. Write the equation of the parabola with the vertex at 1, 4, and containing the point negative 2, 10. All right, I think we talked about this yesterday, or maybe the day before, I don't remember. All right, so think about it now. Think about it in terms of the problem we just did. Didn't this equation give you the vertex? Yes. So since we know the vertex, can we start building the equation? Yep. What do we know is going to go in the parentheses? If this is the vertex, the parentheses has to be x minus, x minus 1. And hanging on the end has to be a four. plus 4. Now that's the framework or the foundation of the equation. But there's a piece missing, isn't there? What's the piece that's missing? We have no idea what that coefficient is. That coefficient controls how fat or thin the parabola is, and I want this one to be just fat enough to hold this point. So how do I figure out what that coefficient is? Plug in 10 for y and negative 2 for x. Remember, this is x and y. Make sure you plug them in the right spot. So 10 equals n times, um, what is that, 3, 9? You going to add that 9 and 4? No. Ha, ha, ha. Only if you want to miss it, right. We're not adding the 9 and the 4. We're subtracting 4 and dividing by 9. So n will be 2 thirds. And there is your equation. two-step problem. Build the foundation of the equation by filling in your vertex. Then find your coefficient by plugging in the other one. And then the last one, here's the given. <coughs> Directions say write the equation of the linear function. What's going on here? Those are two ordered pairs. One comma three, negative two comma nine. What are we gonna do with them? We could graph them. I probably wouldn't, but we, we could absolutely. We could. Find slope. Yeah, we're writing the equation of the linear function right in a line. So what does it take to write the equation of a line? The slope. The slope, yeah. 
I got negative two. And you? And now do whatever you want to do. Either point slope it or slope intercept it. But your ultimate goal is to end up with something that looks like this, right? That is a linear function. So I happen to be a point slope person, so I'm going to do that. But you can do it however you want, as long as you end up with this answer. Whatever you're doing is right if you're ending up with that answer. All right, so next time I see you, first thing, providing I remember, we're going to have a quiz. Okay? And the quiz is going to look like this, plus I'm going to throw in a power function question. That's one of the first things we talked about. Remember, there are three shapes, and the shape depends on the size of the power. So you're going to make sure you know that. And we will do more factoring 